Now joining us with a Democratic perspective, Representative Ro Khanna from California. Uh, Representative Khanna, welcome back. Always great to be on, Jake. All right, uh, wonderful to have you. So, uh, Ro, uh, right now it is unclear uh, if the Democrats are going to be able to hold the Senate uh, or the House, uh, but uh, the House seems less likely for sure. The, the Senate is uh, is it is in dispute and and has some heated battles going on as we speak. Um, so uh, we have been making the case all night that the Democrats should have run on uh, more of an economic agenda, which they didn't. Um, and if, for example, uh, challenging uh, the record profits of corporations and price gouging in the middle of inflation, for example, uh, on uh, um, raising the minimum wage, and then the exit, exit polling showed that those were very popular proposals. And it looks like Democratic leadership just chose not to fight on those grounds. Was that a mistake? Well, I've been saying that we need to fight more on the economy. Look, I think it was correct to talk about reproductive uh, rights and, and choice and that that would be the first thing we codified. It helped, uh, one, it's not just the right thing to do. It also helped, I think, in places like New Hampshire with Maggie Hassan and helped us in some of the uh, early returns where we're seeing holding on to seats in Virginia. But just because we're saying that's the first bill we, we're going to do doesn't mean we can't talk about bills number two through five. And we should have to talk about a corporate windfall uh, profits tax on big oil and putting that money back in the pockets of uh, people who are being fleeced at the pump, uh, putting that money back in uh, rate payers who are paying way too much on utilities. Uh, we should have uh, talked about increasing uh, the minimum wage should have amplified the message of bringing manufacturing jobs home, which uh, Fetterman and Tim Ryan both did. But it's hard to do that as lone candidates when the party isn't amplifying that message. Well, I mean, that does get to uh, the party not amplifying the message. So it became very clear in the middle of this election. And honestly, it's what we've been saying on TYT forever, uh, that if you run tough like Fetterman and Ryan did, that you're more likely to win. And and here's Fetterman with a 13 point lead for now. Uh, you know, we're in the obviously in the middle of the elections and Tim Ryan outperforming, for example, uh, the governor, uh, the gubernatorial candidate in the same state in Ohio by about 20 points. Uh, so obviously that strategy worked. Ro, you're in DC, you're in the Democratic Party. Is there any chance that that message might have actually resonated that that Democrats for the first time in 40 years might think like, hey, maybe we should actually fight Republicans when we're running against them. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the uh, challenge is it's easy uh, to, to just default to the status quo. And the good news is that uh, we are winning some tough races, but we have to look at this and say, what could we have done? I mean, imagine if we had done reproductive rights and the economic message, uh, a Tim Ryan could have uh, uh, probably won. I mean, uh, he still may win, but, you know, it, it, it's likely that uh, he may be a few points back. Uh, what could that have done in a, uh, a race in North Carolina? What could that do in Georgia, depending on the outcome? What could that do in Ma with Masto, where gas prices are still high in Nevada and, and Barnes in Wisconsin? So I'm not arguing that we shouldn't have run on reproductive rights. Of course we should have. But the question is, why didn't we do the second part of the message on the economy and hammer that? And that to me is perplexing that only 9% of the ads were about the economy. Yeah, you know, Nina Turner brought up the very real issue with abortion being outlawed and, and the economic impact that has on, on women who now don't have a choice in, in huge parts of this country and will be forced to carry to term pregnancies uh, that they don't want to carry to term. And so that could have been part of the economic message as well. But when you talk to voters, and it doesn't matter if you're talking to Democrats or Republicans, when you talk to them about what it, which issues matter the most to them, it always boils down to the economy. This isn't rocket science. This has been, you know, a truth in politics for as long as I can remember. And I don't know, I, Congressman Khanna, I, I'm curious if Congress, Democrats in particular, are at all aware of the rage that voters are feeling today. Are they aware? Because the sense that I get from them 
is that they're kind of in their own little bubble, thinking that everything is hunky-dory, everything is fine. But we've been at this rodeo before, and every election, it's the same boring, tired conversation about like, you think Democrats are going to learn some lessons this year? You think they're going to learn from, you know, the need to focus on an economic message that makes people whole? Like, I've just, at this point, I've, I've almost given up hope. And I want to know what's really going on in Congress. Are these lawmakers really aware of the rage that voters are feeling today? Well, I think that the voters are, are very angry at uh, both parties. I mean, I think there's an anger that the American dream is slipping away, that the manufacturing base was offshored, that housing is costing uh, way too much because Wall Street's buying up uh, corporate housing, that no one is going after big oil profits, uh, and that the working class really has uh, lost the opportunity for them and their families to, to, to have economic security. And I don't think that, that people understand how much anger there is just against political institutions and against both parties. Uh, what the Democrats, I think, see themselves as is a bulwark against uh, extremism on the right and against Donald Trump. And, uh, and, and some of them will, I think, take encouragement from some of the results this time that we uh, you know, didn't have a red wave, which seems uh, clear, and every and a governing party loses uh, loses seats. But what we have to look at is, are we responding to the anger and change that people want? So, Representative Kana, um, if uh, the Democrats hold on to the uh, to Congress, both House and Senate, obviously Joe Biden will be strengthened, and uh, he might be more inclined to run for president again for re-election. Uh, if they lose the House and the Senate, or even just one of them, he will be weakened, and uh, it makes it more likely that he will not run. Uh, if he does not run, uh, would you consider running for president? No, I'd support Bernie Sanders, or I would support uh, Elizabeth Warren. But I think the results of today, you know, I was a straight shooter. I, I, I think if, if there was a red wave, there may have been uh, pressure on him. I think a, a result like this, which will be, uh, in my view, seen as likely a mixed result uh, where we may lose the House but not lose it uh, by significant margins and the Senate is a toss-up. Uh, my sense is he runs. Uh, his people are certainly preparing for that. Uh, and I think he will view this and say that this is sort of a historic, better than either Obama or Clinton did in, in, in uh, 94 and 2010. If he runs, do you think anyone runs against him in a Democratic primary? Well, it depends on who TYT gets behind. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, you know, I, I don't think, uh, I, let me put it this way. I think if Donald Trump announces, and the question is whether these results would deter Donald Trump, I don't think they will. I don't know what your view is on, on that. But if he announces, I, I think the party will probably uh, quickly rally around Biden if he runs. Doesn't mean someone may not run, and uh, someone may run on uh, different issues. But I, I don't see a uh, someone uh, from within the House, Senate, or a governor running. But you know, that's I, of course, don't haven't had conversations with everyone. Yeah, um, and uh, and that is super frightening. Uh, Biden versus Trump rematch. Okay, uh, but I, but that's a I. Really important to know uh, what the what the thinking is in D.C. these days, and so let me follow up now on the congressional agenda. Uh, in the in the chance that the Democrats somehow, and by the way, it's not. First of all, as we speak now, we're uh, in the middle of getting the results. It's not impossible at all, uh, and uh, and the numbers have been a little bit better than expected. So let's say that the Democrats hold on to the House uh, and the Senate. Uh, would what what would be the agenda? I mean, are we going to go back to fifteen dollars minimum wage? Are we going to go back to paid family leave, child tax credit, et cetera? Are we going to tr uh, voting rights? Are we going to try to complete the agenda, or has no one really talked about that yet? I I think we would uh, push for uh, codifying Roe versus Wade. That was the promise that we made to to voters, and uh, really make a push for that. My uh, it said says we would really push on child care. That has been uh, something that has come up uh, over and over again and that voters have said, look, we're paying 
way too much for childcare in terms of inflation. I think there would be other measures to tackle inflation. The president's finally come out for Sheldon Whitehouse and my windfall profits tax, which we've been talking about for uh, six months. Uh, I imagine that we would do something on on the big oil to get money back to uh, to, to to people, rate payers. Uh, and the caucus, progressive caucus will push for a $15 wage again, uh, and that would be something, at least raising the minimum wage, uh, that would be at top of uh, top of the agenda. So he, here's the thing that's hard to understand, Representative O'Connor. You guys say that you, you would pass the national right to abortion if you win, but you already had Congress. So I don't get it. Why didn't you just pass it now? Well, it depends if we pick up Senate seats. I mean, we would need to pick up Senate seats because Fetterman and, and uh, I mean, sorry, uh, Manchin and uh, Cinema, as you know, have been a public. You know, this is one criticism, of, and, and I am all for a bold agenda, but, you know, people say, well, why didn't President Obama pass it? And the reality back then is we didn't have the, the 60 votes in the Senate. He should have, we should have passed it through the House, and we have passed it this time through the House. But the question is, what can we do in the Senate? And I'm for abolishing the filibuster, uh, but we need 52 senators to do that. Okay, so let me jump in on that because what I find so fascinating is Democratic leadership loves to stump for Democratic candidates who they can then turn around and point to as the excuse for why they couldn't accomplish a damn thing in their agenda. So. You, you have two different things happening with the Democratic Party right now. Number one, they will literally fund the most like insane lunatic Republican running in these congressional races, thinking that, oh, the Democrat will definitely beat the lunatic Republican, which do they? <laughs> Is that the case every time? It's not. And it's a really, really bad uh, risk to take. But there, that's number one. Number two is... I mean, why do you have Nancy Pelosi, uh, Jim Clyburn, other Democratic leadership going out of their way to crush the progressive candidate running in these primaries to uplift the corporate conservative Democrats? I mean, it happened in Texas in a congressional race. Someone who consistently votes against abortion rights. Why? I mean... It, is it because they want that very convenient excuse for failing to accomplish a damn thing once they're in charge? Is that what it is? Or is there something else going on? I know I've spoken out against both of these practices about the Democratic Party. I've been public, uh, as you may have seen, criticizing the DCCC for propping up uh, right-wing uh, candidates and, and interfering in those primaries. Not, frankly, just for strategic reasons, just for moral reasons. I mean, I don't want to see a country uh, where we're talking about uh, standing up for democracy and the higher ideals, and then we're resorting to that kind of underhanded uh, strategy. I think that's what uh, creates cynicism in our democracy. So uh, I have I agree with you there. On on the other issue, uh, I also agree with you that I incumbents uh, should not get the support of the party. I, look, when I ran against my conda, against an incumbent of my own party, I had the entire party apparatus endorse against me. In fact, I run for Congress three times in contested races, once anti-war against uh, Tom Lantos at 27, and then twice against Mike Honda. And I've had the uh, distinction of having Nancy Pelosi endorse, endorse against me in all three races. So, uh, you know, the party has this view that they always stand behind incumbents. And I don't think that should be the case. I, if someone challenged me, I don't think that automatically Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and Nancy Pelosi should all endorse me. I think it should be up to my district. And I, I have a lot of advantages already as an incumbent, frankly. I, I, I have name ID and I have a network. Uh, so let the incumbents, like anyone else, compete on their own merits. Yep. So Representative Connor, one more thing uh, before we let you go. Um, if the Democrats lose the House, and uh, what would be the strategy at that point for the Democratic Party? Um, you know, how do you how do you hold the Republicans back from doing their agenda? Well, I th the president obviously will have to to, to veto a lot a, a lot of the uh, Republican efforts. Uh, the uh, bigger issue, though, is for the Progressive Caucus in the in the House to to hammer home the need for a strong economic agenda. Because even if we hold the Senate, uh, however we do in the House. I don't think it would be smart to underestimate the Republicans in 2024 or Donald Trump in 2024. It shows 
My sense is what this election will show is this country is deeply split. And that means that the economic issues will be front and center in 24. And I, uh, you know, I took to the New York Times saying we needed a stronger agenda in inflation in the summer. I've said we need to, I took the Boston Globe. I'm right again about having a clear economic vision. And I think that will be the role for the Progressive Caucus to push for us to do that. Yes. And by the way, uh, so, you know, when, uh, Honestly, when politicians are on here, we challenge them and, and we, you know, we are aggressive in doing so. Uh, but we also call it out when they are correct. Uh, so Representative Khanna did uh, push for a windfall profits tax on the oil companies six months ago. As he said, that is accurate. That is correct. Uh, on all the things that he just mentioned in pushing the Democratic Party in the right direction. Look, it, the, the numbers bear him out. He was right. They should have gone in that direction, and they might have done a little bit better tonight if they had. Uh, Representative Connor, thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. It's always a pleasure.